Our next speaker would be what one might call an expert in gaming, although he's not just that, he's, uh, he's written for the Wall Street Journal. As I was looking for something, a way to introduce him, I was looking for statistics on gaming and uh, came across some things that, that just blew my mind. So in 2009, there were 273 million units, I guess those are games, sold in the US for over $10 billion. That the average age of a gamer is 34. 40% of gamers are women. And even if you don't know what a gamer is, hopefully you can, you can imagine. Uh, and this is probably changing your, your mind as to what that is. Uh, Worlds of Warcraft has 12 million subscribers. And the thing that blew me away the most, because I'm, I have to say I'm kind of addicted to this game, but Angry Birds has been downloaded 700 million times. So um, just today, there was an article on the front page of the New York Times, or actually it'll probably be on the front page tomorrow, about gaming called Stupid Games. And uh, it was talking about how gaming affects our culture and vice versa. So we have someone here who can explain that effect much better than I can. I'd like to invite up Jamin Warren. So my name's, uh, my name's Jamin Warren. Um, I run a video game arts and culture company. I think that was the term that you were looking for. It was in the bio. <laughs> um, venture so to speak. Um, and I'm up here to talk about games. I'm going to talk a little bit about like my background and then kind of the theme of the talk is the future of games because I get asked that like on a daily basis. It comes in through the internet and whatnot. So anyway, so I started my career as an arts and entertainment reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I cover just about everything. So initially, like when I started, they were like, oh, what are the kids up to, right? Like, oh, tell us about like youth and youth culture and you know, my career before that was, um, I, was a, I was a music critic. I wrote for Pitchfork and the Washington Post and a bunch of other places. And I said, all right, sure, uh, I can do that. I'm ostensibly a kid <laughs> at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and so I was tasked with um, covering all facets of culture. So I covered comic books. I covered jump rope competitions in North Carolina. Um, I wrote about the Nintendo Wii, that people were using the DJ and whatnot. And I thought, well, there's two things I've done my entire life. One is read, and the other one is play video games. So I thought, all right, great. I'm going to be the video game guy at the Wall Street Journal. And I discovered very quickly that the Wall Street Journal wasn't particularly looking for a video game guy. And that was emblematic of the way that a lot of large media institutions, uh, perhaps with the exception of the New York Times, thought about games, which is that they're kid stuff, in spite of the millions and millions of dollars that are spent every year on you know, games like Angry Birds or Grand Theft Auto, that this was not something that serious people looked at. And the other thing I found out was that a lot of the dialogue around games was targeted mostly at kids, or adults pretending to be kids, right? So your perception of who a gamer is is you know, someone in their basement, lights off, screaming you know, profanity at someone around the world all hours a day, right? So I was like, all right, so I'm gonna start you know, something new. So we started Kill Screen uh, roughly about three years ago. Um, we're a content company, so we produce a seasonal magazine. Uh, we produce daily content, which is syndicated on Pitchfork, um, which is one of the largest music websites in the world. And then one of the things that we're most proud of is our events. Last year, we did a one-night arcade at the Museum of Modern Art that looked at the intersection of art and games and brought about 1,200 people out to the museum. We're working with the Lincoln Center over the next eight months doing uh, programming and inside the actor studio style look at uh, video game designers. But I was always really interested at the intersection of games, culture, music, design, arts, whatnot. Like what it means to be an adult and to look at games. So anyway, so the future of games. I get asked this question like all the time. Like I work at a bar and people figure out what they want to do and or what they do and I tell them like I work in video games. And so I'm gonna start with what I think the future of games, which I actually think is Education, because I, I think that that's actually how. <laughs> so, how many people have played Oregon Trail? <laughs> For how many people was this your first game that you ever played? A couple people. Um, so for most people, uh, for a lot of people, you know, Oregon Trail was one of the first times that you ever 
you know, if you ever experienced a video game, and albeit it was in an educational context, right? And so if you look at the early history of video games and the context of education, and it was always directed at something else. The idea was that you took all the educational structures and then you just imputed them on top of games. So for Oregon Trail, which was developed by three, uh, three programmers in the Midwest, they said, we want to teach kids about the history of the Oregon Trail. So let's just make a video game about the Oregon Trail. Um, but there's this idea that games in their own right don't have any intrinsic value of their own. The idea is that you know, games don't teach anything. And when they do, they only teach things that you're already supposed to be learning. So games are supposed to be preparation for the SATs. They're supposed to be preparation for later life. They teach you how to do something. They're very functional. High emphasis on like content retention, right? And the Oregon Trail, you're supposed to beat the Oregon Trail you learn what life is like. Although, interestingly enough, the creators of Oregon Trail, they didn't know this, but um, what they found was when they were watching kids play, they would notice that kids would start when they beat the game. They would send, um, they would help other students complete the Oregon Trail. And it turns out that in the Oregon Trail, the, uh, if you look at the mortality rates, they went from roughly like you know, 60, 70, percent when the Oregon when they first started traveling the Oregon Trail to down 30, 40 percent because people who made it there were actually sending letters back. So this is a weird example where like games can actually create environments and mimic information and things and patterns that happen in the real world. Um, anyway, so the, the new way of thinking about games and education um, are things like Quest to Learn, which has anybody heard of Quest to Learn? It's a school here in the city. Um, it was, it was a, it's a New York City charter school, and uh, the idea is to think about games as a system, right? That games, they don't have to be about, you have to teach like number crunchers or something like that. But it's this idea that, um, that school is really just a quote unquote designed experience that's part of their language. And the participant is motivated to achieve a goal while, while operating inside a prescribed set of boundaries and rules, right? And I've heard one person say that school is already a game, it's just a poorly designed one. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, I you know so that got me thinking a lot about like so education and whatnot. And last year I did a uh, oh so question one anyway. So it's awesome. They have this great curriculum. It's built around systems. It's built around this year long game. And you solve puzzles. And this you know the, the students want to learn more because what's great about games is that they're their own form of, of assessment, right? So if you're terrible at Angry Birds, like you can't just cheat your way through Angry Birds, right? I mean I guess you can. There's that you know, um, the giant mighty eagle thing. But for the most part, like in school, you can just kind of be a C student or whatever, and, or a D student, and just kind of get by, right? The games are great because what's wonderful about games is you can't move any further unless you learn new things, which is how school is supposed to be. But it turns out, so one of the big barriers for a school like Quest to Learn, and there's a similar school in Chicago, is uh, its parents. Um, I did a, I was on a panel about two years ago um, with some folks that the MacArthur Foundation had put on. And afterwards, I talked to some parents whose students were enrolled in Quest to Learn, which I think is wonderful. Um, they're not paying me to say this. <laughs> um, but some of the parents were saying that you know, one of the big problems is that when they tell the other parents that, oh yeah, my son or daughter is enrolled in this Quest to Learn school, and they're like, oh yeah, the video game school, they have this image in their head of like what games are and then what games should be, and then they don't quite match up. It's like, well, school is this thing we're supposed to learn and games are mindless nonsense. Ergo, like, oh, your child goes to school where they sit around and play Grand Theft Auto all day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, one of the big problems in terms of thinking about games is all the cultural baggage that we carry along with it. Um, so I'm gonna take a twist here. Um, so my interest in education is slightly different. I'm not particularly interested in, you know, joining a DOE or you know, building a better school or anything like that. But I am interested, that, uh, interested in the sense that um, we often think of games as a, as a means to some grander end as opposed to end in them themselves. I've been really inspired by um, a, a friend of mine, uh, his name's Chris Don, he has a son. And what's great is that um, Chris is a game literate father. So that means he picks games that are appropriate for his son to play. Not just things that are marketed to him. So one of the games that he's been playing is this game called Machinarium, which was done by this Polish studio, um, which is your like a little robot in this kind of steampunk era. Um, sort of battling this secret organization known as the Brotherhood. But what's great about it is that what Chris knows is that my son needs to be playing a game with me. So Chris understands the mechanics of games. He doesn't succumb to like marketing and whatnot. Um, so what I really think about the future of games is, um, so the, the future of games isn't technology, it's actually culture. Um, a lot of times when we think about like, what's the next new thing, right? It's this device, it's always around some new device or new piece of software or some new thing that's going to look better and make games more realistic. But I actually think that the future of games is, is actually culture. And I will use as an example a game called Flower. Has anybody heard of this game before? 
that's kind of cool. Uh -huh. um, so Flower is designed by a game studio, um, um, a game studio in Santa Monica. Um, Flower, as the name suggests, is not a first-person shooter. You are a uh, flower. <laughs> You're a flock of that is incredibly violent. That's just that comes out of people that part when you cut them open. Uh, <laughs> no, you're actually you're a flock of petals, and it asks this big question: What do flowers dream about? So you're a flower in a city. What do you think about? And you think about open pastures, and it's pretty zen-like and meditative. And I spoke to someone at the studio, and they said, "All right, we have this great vision for what games could be, and about it's going to change people's lives." But the problem was that. They weren't targeting the person who owned a PlayStation 3, they target the person next to the person who owns a PlayStation 3, which is pretty difficult to market to. And so here you have this like really revolutionary, groundbreaking game like in search of an audience, right? And this is, this is a game that's like pushing the boundaries of what games could be and what they could potentially represent and how they are considered in the pantheon of the arts, and yet they were still having a hard time finding an audience. If this was a film, it would be at Sundance, but you know, at the end of the day, you have to own a PlayStation 3, so they had a marketing problem there. Um, so that got me thinking that like, you know, one of the big problems is that education is a prerequisite for innovation. And this is not just true for games, this is true for lots of different things. This is my like, Stephen Johnson kind of big ideas uh, segment of the talk. But it's this idea that like, you can't, no matter how revolutionary games actually are, if we don't create the kind of cultural environment that allows people to talk about them, to discuss them in a way that's actually meaningful. It doesn't matter how many CPU processors we add to the PlayStation 5, 6, 7, or the Xbox 1080, or whatever it might be, iPad 10, or whatever. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how good the technology gets, because if we don't create the type of you know, culture that understands those sorts of things, it really doesn't matter. It's like if you showed someone a light bulb 300 years ago, um, aside from the fact there's no electricity, they wouldn't understand what it was. Even though they were looking at a piece of the future, they would say, well, that's not relevant to my life right now, which is, also, which, which is often what happens with games. So one big place where I think that happens is um, uh, with uh, Zynga. How many of you are familiar with the company Zynga? Right, so um, so Zynga is a big, huge startup company. It's like you know one of the, it, and it just went public and it accounts for more than ten percent of Facebook's revenues. Yada yada. yada. So what Zynga's kind of come under fire. The Times wrote about this and we've written about this also. Is that what Zynga's business model is? Is they find innovation in other places and then they just go buy it up, right? But oftentimes um, when they don't get a chance to purchase a company who's come up with something new, they will make something that's very similar to the thing that exists. So on the left is a game called Tiny Tower, which was created by a studio called Nimblebit, uh, and on the right was uh, a version that Zynga made called Dream Heights. Uh, the game is functionally the same. And so I want to be clear, like, so people call this cloning. And the problem is it's not, it's not a moral issue, right? And people don't know this. Like, so Angry Birds, that was the 48th or 49th game that, um, that Rovio had made. It's also very similar to a lot of other games in the trebuchet style category. Um, I mean, part of the process of building games is innovating on other, you know, other people's ideas, and then sometimes the process of games is just taking them and then selling them to a larger public. I'm not critiquing the business model because I think there's a lot, obviously, Zynga is an incredibly successful company, and Mark Pincus, the CEO, makes this argument that you don't have to be first to market, you just have to be best to market, and I think that he's probably right. But I'm more concerned about like, how we think about things like this, right? So you see this in other arenas. Um, this is a film that probably, has anybody seen this film? Transformers. <laughs> it's uh, actually, yeah, this is the original, this is the source material for the entire Transformers. Um, so, so when we look at a film like Transformers, uh, Trans <laughs> Transformers, that got me. Uh, if you look at a film like Transformers, like no one's going to go into the store and think this is this film by Michael Bay, right? Because we understand who Michael Bay is as, as a director, and um, we understand that you know there's an original idea there, and it's not going up for any Academy Awards. And the studio that makes it, Asylum, this is all they do. They make movies like there's a National Treasure clone called National Secret or whatever. But the, but the point is that like people understand um, film history, right? And they say they think, oh, I already know. It's not just a marketing thing, but they understand. The long lineage of them. If you try and copy somebody's idea too explicitly, then generally people will call you out about it. And that doesn't really happen in games, and I think that that's really, really sad. Um, so I, I think one place, you know, one place where I don't want games to end up is like is comics. So comics are an art form that's as old 
as the cave paintings in France, as you know, Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's in, in this incredibly powerful medium. What comics do in between the different panels in terms of storytelling, and it's a really wonderful medium. But in the 50s, the culture in the United States didn't really understand comics to be that. They didn't see what the potential was going to be. So they created this thing called the Comics Code, and comics were banned, and there were you know burnings and whatnot. It set comics back as an art form about 50 years. But if you look at France and Belgium and other countries where that didn't happen, they're still lauded you know as, as high art. And I worry the same thing could happen with games. Um, how many of you have heard of Brown versus EMA? This is a court, Supreme Court case last year. Anybody? Okay. All right. So this is going to blow your mind. Um, it probably won't blow your mind. But, but. Um, so, so last year, um, video games almost had, so it's huge, you know, $60 billion industry, almost had a comic books moment. So Brown versus EMA was a court case that came out of California, sort of an overreaching attorney general who decided that he wanted to criminalize uh, you know, any store that sold violent video games to teens. So I want to be clear, I think that's terrible. No one should sell violent video games to teens. But the idea was that you'd be fine, and that would place video games in a special category. That category of, uh, would also include tobacco, firearms, pornography, uh, and alcohol. There's a whole bureau. They wear jackets. <laughs> you would have to add a V on there as well, uh, so they could you know, kick down doors at Best Buys and you know, shake down you know, some poor cashier who's selling it came to a kid with a fake ID. Um, so, so anyways, this case, this case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and fortunately, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of free speech. Yay. Um, but the fact, my concern is that we all know what video games are, we all know who gamers are, but nobody seems to know that last year, you know, culturally, we really dodged a bullet. This would have done terrible things to the video game industry. It would have you know, discouraged innovation. Uh, publishers would be more concerned about whether or not the, you know, the stores that sold them would be uh, would be facing fines versus like how can we think more creatively about storytelling and that's what can happen with games so you know I think there are two things that you know so how do we do this right so how do we start to think about games as a form of culture and there are two things um, one uh, are events like this right um, how many people chose the game name tag anybody will oh, yeah. yeah all right what'd you guys pick Scrabble, Scrabble. amazing what'd you pick life. what'd you pick life, life. That's an amazing game also. Um, this guy did too, come on, Jeff. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so the first thing would be like events like this, right? But the second thing is more practical. It's just talking about games. I mean, a lot of times you go to a dinner table conversation, no one really talks about the games that they play. You talk about the Oscars, even if you haven't seen the films. You talk about the books you've read, but if you try and bring up what new game have you played, that's not really gonna come up in conversation. Um, there's a great quote from director Alejandro Hodorowsky. And he says, if I speak, I create futures. If I remain silent, then the present is eternal. Oh. And so at Kill Screen, we've kind of interpreted that as a different way. Say how you play. Thank you very much. All right, because we're short for time, we're going to take two questions. But the good thing is that they're going to be hanging around after, hopefully. And uh, you can speak to them at will and buy them a beer or dinner yes. or, or propose or whatever. Buy me a beer. So, um, questions? Yeah, so can, can you translate that into English first? Yes, so there are <laughs> so there are a bunch of things out there that will turn your life into a game if you wanted to. Um, and more recently, that's been called gamification, um, which is a terrible, terrible term. Not because it's a dumb term, but for a variety of reasons. Uh, so I think that there's two ways to think about games. There's games as systems, and then there's games as entertainment. Most people know games as a form of entertainment. Um, that's something you play. And then games as a system is just like something that you live. So like traffic is kind of a game, right? It's bounded by a rule set, and then you sit in traffic, and you sort of vaguely compete with other people to get to a destination at a set time, right? So there are all these things in life. You know, going to the hospital is kind of like a game, right? <laughs> your, uh, you know, your health might be very low. I mean, so there are all these elements of like gameplay that are very similar to things that we already do. And I think that the, I think, I think it's just a function of we want to make sure that we're orienting people because games are very powerful towards the right types of things um, and not towards things that are 
evil, you know, the whole with great power comes great responsibility type thing. But yeah. One more question. Come on. <laughs> There's one back there. There's one back there. Where? Oh, flowered shirt man, tall. Flowered shirt man, please <laughs> step forward. forward. The Sam. Come forward. Sam. So, uh, I actually later a lot in elementary school. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I've noticed is a lot of these. But you said loiter. Sam loitered a lot during high school. No, I still do. I can't get enough of it. I still want to go back to Lane. But most of the games that I see kids playing are video games with like educational material kind of slapped on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they're not integrated at all. And so, uh, you know, I don't know. My question to you is like, what's the answer to that? Or do you know any games that solve that problem? Because like Tabula Digita and Dimension University, which I'm pretty familiar with, it's, it's literally like, it's just two things like kind of together. Yeah, so um, games should learn from Sesame Street, right? Because Jim Henson, there was an incredible Jim Henson retrospective at the Museum of um, the Moving Image uh, last year. And what Jim Henson understood was the craft of television. And he understood commercials because that was his world, right? And so he said, all right, so I'm not going to make something that's explicitly educational, but I'm going to use this tool set, the tool set of television, and use that as best as possible um, to sort of teach kids about things, because I understand, I think I understand how attention basically works. Um, Inconvenient Truth, another great example, that's not just a great film because it's about global warming, it's a great film because it's directed by Davis Guggenheim, who did Deadwood and a variety of other things. And so, um, I think really what needs to happen, one of the big problems with games is that the people who are really talented are in the traditional games industry. But I think what you're gonna see is those people are getting older, and the same way that um, you know, George Lucas basically decided to start investing in films that he believed in, like, uh, like Red Tails, which didn't do well, but he believed in it. You're gonna see older game designers who are really talented start thinking about education. Well, right is one. So I think that the problem is twofold. Uh, I mean, the solution is twofold. I think one is respect games as games and build those first. And then if it makes sense, make them educational. Because all games teach things. All games are educational. Um, which is like a misnomer that there's this idea of like educational games. The same way that like there's a social games category. And all games are social, um, except for solitaire and golf. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think, I think the second thing is uh, wait. I know it's not a great answer. But I think that there are more things coming down the pipeline, particularly as sort of, you have to remember the games are really young. Like the people who created like the Game Boy and um, they're in their 50s now, and which is amazing that that medium is so young and these people are still hot, but I think you're going to see more of them thinking more creatively about education and educational systems. Great. Thank you. Thank you.